This week on the House of Static, from London, England, by way of Portugal, singer, songwriter, and PhD psychologist, Karina Teixeira. Welcome to the House of Static, everybody. And uh, as you know, I'm Bob, or maybe you don't know, but I'm Bob still either way. And uh, also known as the Static Dive, my friend Kilo House. I'm in New York. Kilo's in Los Angeles. And yeah. uh, there you go. Say say hello, Kilo. Hello, Kilo. <laughs> All right. <laughs> And uh, today, our guest is uh, is Karina Teixeira, or Karina T, uh, a singer, a psychologist, scientist, very cool person who is uh, currently in, based and living in London. So we've, we are spanning the globe here today. We've got London, New oh, York, and L.A. I love it when we do that. Oh. Karina is a singer, a songwriter, and as I said, a psychologist will get into all of that. But Karina, why don't you say hello and, uh, you know, elaborate on whatever it is I just said. Oh, hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me to your show. I'm I'm delighted to be here. Um, as you said, uh, we've been talking via email and uh, social media <laughs> for some years now, but it's the first time that we are talking uh, in a video call. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you That's so much. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, yes, indeed. So, and with you, Kilo, it's the first time that I, I that we are yeah. seeing each other. But I heard um, some of your songs on Instagram, and I, I oh. love them so much. Oh, it actually you. increased my energy. I needed a, a little bit of energy for the show. So, thank you for you that. I'll listen to Kilo's music. You know, give me energy. That's there you good. Go. That's what it's all so, about. Why don't you I start to dance up in music. right? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, that's why I write my music the way I do. Why don't you tell our audience, though, like what got you interested in music? Like what age you were, like what what introduced you into the world of music? Uh, so um, when I was uh, 15 years old and I, I lived, I was born in Madeira Island, uh, an island which is part of Portugal. I don't know if you ever heard about it. And uh, I started to sing there in Madeira uh, when I was a teenager. I had a band um, and it all started there. And then when I was 18, I moved to Portugal, to the mainland of Portugal to study. And while I was a university student, I, I was uh, part of a band. I used to sing and play uh, an instrument called Cavaquinho, which is a Portuguese instrument which uh, has four strings. It's similar to a ukulele. Oh, and yeah. that that was it. I was singing and playing uh, Cavaquinho uh, in this band, which uh, was more um, focused on traditional uh, Portuguese music. Mm -hmm. That's pretty so cool. So when, when you were growing up, did you mainly listen to Portuguese music or did you hear music from all over the world or all over the world uh, when I was growing up I was I, I mean I love Portuguese music but I was listening to Jewel uh, to U2 Smashing Pumpkins uh, Queen you know a variety of artists um even Brazilian music as well, African music. So I'm very eclectic in my in my music preferences. Right, that's, that's very cool. And uh, now, as you mentioned, you grew up in uh, in Portugal and or the island of Madeira. You said it was right. And yes, Madeira yeah, Island. Do you know Madeira? By the way, I'm always very curious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I've only I've heard of it because of you, oh, honestly. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So what were you going to say, Keila? You have your. Oh you're no, familiar? I was going to say I've heard of it because right, I've yeah. heard of it. That's that's about all I can say about it. I don't know what it looks like or <laughs> I didn't know it was in Portugal. Just it's definitely heard of the island it's a, before. It's a little island surrounded by water. You know, it's <laughs> that's awesome. So, so that means you've lived a lot of places around the world, right? You've lived yeah. in. You've lived. Just tell us all the places you've lived. So. Uh, started uh, in Madeira Island, then mainland Portugal. Then the first time I I moved to London, it was in 2011. 
And then I was here in London for one year at that time. And then I lived for one year, nine months in, in France. Then I went back to Portugal. And then I went to Boston, <laughs> to the United oh, okay. States. I lived in Boston two years. And then I moved to London. Oh, okay. And I have been in London since uh, 2016. That's cool. Do you feel like living all over the world has had any influence on your music? Um, well, Probably, I have to say, I, that's a great question because, yes, definitely, not only because of the different styles that I was exposed to, but also because of what I lived in those different places, the stories that I went through, they right. have a, an impact on, on, on my songs, on what right. I... Well, that's, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So your life changes because you because your location changes. And as a result, those life experiences color your music. So you're influenced by the, the culture around you, but also just by, you know, the people you meet, the things you do and everything else. That makes a lot of sense. I think we should probably probably point out anyway why you've traveled all over these places and everything because people are watching and going well what's this independent singer songwriter doing moving all around the world i was but, wondering <laughs> that myself and exactly. i'm one of the hosts so exactly. you're right Bob. exactly see i know the answer but i and the answer as i mentioned in the beginning right is that uh karina is a psychologist she's a doctor of psychology and uh research psychologist does a lot of very interesting things so that I believe, Karina, right? It's, That's the yeah. reason you were traveling all over the place. When you tell us a little about that, yeah. Um, every I think that most people, uh, when they first meet me, they get a bit surprised. Uh, why so many places? But <laughs> it, it, the reason is what you've mentioned. So I did my my PhD, uh, my doctorate in psychology, and as part of my PhD. I had a supervisor, a PhD supervisor in London. That's why I came to London in the first place. And then when I finished my PhD, I had this job opportunity in Boston at Boston University to conduct research in psychiatric rehabilitation. And I thought, why not? I mean, right. why not? Right at, at that right. time, I, you know, I just was open to new experiences and i i had the best time in, in boston um you know i boston for me is like i don't know i don't want to be misinterpreted but it's the most european city in the, in the united states i don't That's know true. Uh, no, i agree with that I, 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 i'm pretty close to boston geographically speaking i'm like you know a couple hours away and um and you're right. I mean, they call it New England for a reason, I think. You know what I mean? It is and it is very right. There are a couple of cities around the world, around the country, around the United States that are more European than I and I think Boston is one of them. Uh New Orleans is one. New Orleans is crazy because it's like every, it's like all of Europe in one city. It's very weird. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh St. Oh. Louis is St. Louis is a little bit like that too. I've been to St. Louis and mm -hmm. To be honest, I had a, a like a, a crazy experience there. But anyway, uh, I when I was living in Boston, I I got to travel to different cities in the United States, so New York, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, nice. and uh, and I I just love it. Um, so many stories there. That's awesome. <laughs> like oh, in the yeah, movies. That's, awesome. that's that's fantastic. What's your favorite place that you've lived? If you don't mind me asking. Um, that's a great question as well, because I don't know if I have a favorite one. Um, mm. uh, for example, Portugal and Madeira uh, was is the place where I was born and I, I grew up there. So it's very special to me as it is Portugal, very special to me because it's uh, it's my country. Oh, but man. then I have special I, I lived special experiences in all the countries and I met people who still nowadays are so special to me, for example, in the United States. And even though I, I left the States in 2016, I am still very close to the people that I met there. And so I cannot tell you a, a favorite. I can tell you about different things that I like about different places. I, for example, although I love Boston, 
I hate the weather. I mean, I hate the winter <laughs> right. there. Sorry. I, yeah, so for sure. There are different things that I like about different places. Right, mm -hmm. right. Well, so I can... I, 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 well, I was just going to say, as the one person here that's in the middle of one of those winters right now, I can tell you. <laughs> I, I'm from originally from New Hampshire or New England. I was born in New oh, Hampshire. Oh, there's poles so there. I know. Yeah, I definitely know that that is not a fun place to be when it's winter time. It's <laughs> no, very it's bad. Not. So definitely not. Totally understandable. Yeah. So at the be what I was going to say before I or when I cut Bob off was. Um, we told people at the beginning of the show that you were a psychologist. Can you just run us through real fast what made you decide you wanted to do that? And like, what made you choose that as your like job path? Right. It's like uh, two parallel kind of uh, very different existences, artist and, and scientist. Uh, well, I don't know, but. Okay. Uh, or maybe not. Yeah. Uh, well, I love this kind of subject because it, I have to say that many people with who I work in academia, in the psychology field, they don't know my artist sides. And, uh, and for some people, it's a bit confusing because maybe I'm not, um, I don't know how to explain this, the typical acad academic, because right. usually, you know, the, the kind of music that I do uh, is not, you know, the most intellectual music. And I say this with pride, to be honest. Uh, and, you know, it was, if, for example, people would more easily associate an academic with a person who sings jazz, you know. Like classical or something like classical, that. Classical. Right? And yeah. I'm mainstream, a bit alternative, but you know, not very, very alternative. But um, but I still think that um, although I perform different roles in, in my life, um, I'm still the same person in, the, in all these contexts. What I mean is that um, although psychology and um, academia and music, they are different fields that are... A, a lot of psychology in my songs and also my music also conveys what I am and what I am is this uh, whole, uh, You're human, a whole human being, right? You're a whole exactly. person. Right. right. Um, I think that's really interesting. I think that, cause I was curious about that too, right. About, about your parallel careers, because I used, because I, I, I had, uh, I worked in, I was an, I'm a com IT guy for years. I was a computer guy and, and a corporate kind of, you know, boss. And I didn't like it. That's great. <laughs> no, it wasn't great. It was awful. But, <laughs> but I did it for a very long time. It wasn't awful. Some of it was really great. And I accomplished some things I'm very you proud of. You know it was awful. Bob. Well, Don't well, there, there are things about it that I'm proud of, but I'm glad to be done with it. But, um, but anyway... <laughs> Well, one thing I was, I remember we had an episode, I don't know, one of the episodes we had, we were talking to somebody about it. And I said that one thing that I realized, I would be in these meetings, right? And I tell people, you know, you know, you would be in the before or after a meeting, hey, what'd you do this weekend? Blah, blah, blah. And I'd be like, oh, I had a gig. And everybody would look at me like, a what? Who are you? What is that? You know right. what I mean? And, right. like, and I used to always like apologize almost. I'd be like, well, yeah, I'm what I'm, I'm really a musician. You know, like I'd always say, like, what I really do is music. And they'd be like, well, you're here and we're paying you to be here. So I'm pretty sure that's not really what you do. You know what I mean? So it was a very strange balance that I, I really gave, stopped trying to maintain. So I'm I was curious about how you maintain it. Uh, I think it's it's so, so interesting what you've just said, because um, I want to to feel uh, like an artist, to be honest. But when you work uh, in a more conventional job and you have a, a kind of a more or less established career in a, in a more conventional job, um, it, for, people may see what you do uh, in, in the artistic field, like, oh, is this a hobby? Uh, but for me, right. to be honest, my music is more than a hobby. Right. And uh, for me to be here, for example, with you both, it's so important because it strengthens, uh, it, it strengthens my 
my identity as, as an artist, um, which is something that I want to keep. Uh, yeah. And I think that I th and I agree. And I think that I think that communicating with other artists on a regular basis, talking to musicians about music is I, I think that's very important. I, I now, as especially as I've done the, the, the last year, basically spent most of my time talking to musicians about music. Um, yeah, I, I just made me a better musician. You know what I mean? And I, and I think connecting with other other players and other artists of any stripe. Right. I think it's uh, right. I think it's very important. For the artistic mind. That's Definitely. And yeah. we've heard on our show before from, I think, three other people that they really enjoyed talking to us because they don't get to talk to other musicians. Right. And I'm <laughs> sitting here in L.A., you know, part of a collective called Icon Collective going, how do you not have contact with other artists? <laughs> yeah. So for me, that was weird to wrap my head around. Like, I don't know if I would be the same artist without constant communication with other artists right. so that's a good point that you point out bob that like right. but but on your past point i think psychology and music and business and music are a little bit different in the yeah. way you go about it for her to keep the balance because like like you know i was like life coaching before this mm -hmm. be way be long years and years ago but like i went from that to being depressed myself and going well fuck if i can't fix myself then i can't fix anybody else and that's when i decided well i can do music that will fix other people you know mm -hmm. or like help other people be happier right. so i think it's a teeny bit different than you're seeing it because still um the things me and you do especially with like your new record that came out zen seeds like we wrote that and worked on it and made it perfect to make people feel right. a certain way and, and to be able to deal with stuff. And I think that, I mean, obviously that's what a psychologist does. Yeah. So yeah, I think, little, yeah, I think you're right. You, or do you agree with us or do you agree with me? Am I wrong? You would know, but she would know better than me, you know? Uh, well, let me see if I, um, understood your point yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, so your point is that obviously uh although we can um music and psychology or life coaching uh one can influence the other they are very different things and different pathways and um and i agree with you and one of the reasons that i, I started to do music was that i was uh studying and working on on a paradigm uh called the paradigm of recovery and recovery basically is uh living a meaningful life and you are you try to guide people to live a meaningful life and i was guiding people to live a meaningful life but mine i didn't have all the pieces of the puzzle there was a, a piece of the puzzle missing and so if you if you can't can't live a living a meaningful life yourself, how can you uh, <laughs> right. guide people to, to live a so meaningful true. life? Um, mm. so I think I, I'm in agreement with you. Um, and uh, I I think that obviously maybe I would want to do more music than I do right now, and maybe one of the barriers that I have is having a full-time job which leaves me very little time to invest in my music yes but right. i i think in the future i would like to spend less time working in psychology in academia and, and working more time uh, yeah i wonder if the if the uh ultimately the answer to that right would be um kind of to continue on the path with your music that you have been because what I'm getting at is that your music, uh, your songs uh, almost always, I think every one of your songs to some degree deals with um, mental health issues, psychological, psychology issues. You know, you're, you sort of, you're, you're kind of, you're kind of, uh, you know, helping people, tr tr you know, it's almost like musical therapy, right? right. And, it is. I, it is. Although um, it's not really um, planned. Because some people that they know uh, about my parallel careers, 
they may think that, oh, she's planning, like uh, everything is very carefully planned. But no, I, it's not, right. the process is not like that. I don't think now I want to write a, a song okay. about suicide right. or I want yeah. to write a song about domestic violence. It happens uh, within the context. For example, when I uh, released um, I Know It's Over, which is a cover song uh, by the, the Smiths. And the, the, um, the first time I heard that song, actually, it was uh, the Jeff Buckley's version. And I fell in love with the song. I, I loved it so much. I didn't even uh, had the chance to, to, to dive into the lyrics, but I, I just, it just touched me uh, so much. And then I said, I want to do a, co a cover of this song. But I didn't have any idea about the music video right. but while I was re rehearsing the song and I was recording the song and when I was you know interpreting the lyrics I thought oh I think I could do a music video to raise awareness about suicide but it all started with a song it didn't right. start with the topic and when with the song about dom domestic violence when we started to write the lyrics, myself and my partner in crime, Rui, um, we didn't think right away about the domestic violence. But as the song uh, progressed, it then it makes it, it made sense at the end. So I just wanted to convey this idea that it doesn't right. start with I want to talk about this or that or right. depression. It's it's a process, and but I cannot. Uh, minimize the fact that I am a psychologist so I probably I am more biased towards those topics mm -hmm. well right. I mean something we've definitely pointed out on the show before that I at least I definitely believe is that like what you put into your mind is what you put out of your mind what you give out of your mind and so even if subconsciously I mean even if consciously you're not thinking like I'm I'm writing this about suicide. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. You still are a product of your environment. That's why I'm urging anyone who's listening to us every every week, like whatever they're doing, like you need to be be sure to make sure like what you're consuming on a daily basis, whether it's on YouTube or on a podcast or on Netflix or whatever you're doing, is what you want to put out. Whether you're a painter or an actor, or anything, because that will come out of you regardless without you even realizing. So you, that's yeah. probably what's happening with you. Right. You are what you eat, but you're also what you think, you're what you see, what you're what you, right. who you hang out with. All of those things contribute to who you are and then what you, cre what you create, right? Definitely. Definitely. And, um, and, and I totally uh, agree with you. And I think that if you... I don't have many songs, but all the songs that I have, uh, you can see me there. What I, what I want to say is that I will not sing uh, lyrics that I don't identify myself with or right. and I, I'm not a um, I'm not business oriented, to be honest. I, I that's not in me. I mean, some right. people are, are great. Uh, business men and business women, women. I, I'm not. I mean, I don't. Sometimes people tell me, for example, when I released um, the music video about domestic violence, I had you know very good feedback, but also not so good feedback. Like uh, people telling me, okay, I I I I love your your songs, I love your voice, but you know, we need you know you always it seems that the, the last songs that you released they are uh, you know about uh, strong topics i want you to, to do something oh. more you know happy like you know jennifer lopez and i was <laughs> like no i love jennifer lopez no. but, you know right. it everything i do it has i have i have to feel it and right. I, I love happy songs and don't 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 get me wrong and uh you know, I have a, a song bucket list that it was created to be uh, inspiring and uh, uplifting. But well, just to say that, OK, I'm talking about these topics because I think they are important. And we as society, we need to talk about this because unfortunately, 
the world is not only uh, right. beautiful things and right. good things that are negative things that we have to acknowledge and to to discuss and not just uh, you know hide um but the i am you know and i know that when people uh, do this kind of comments and especially these people that i'm talking about it, 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 these comments they come from a place of love so i i respect and i embrace it but my answer is i will always do whatever i'm feeling and not because i am business oriented yeah. so i'm not going to to create this song because i think that i will have more followers or more listeners right right well you know and i think oh go oh, ahead sorry Oh, oh no, I was just going to say, I think that the power of music sometimes just making people realize they're not alone with a struggle. So when you write a song about domestic violence or whatever, right, having someone realize, I know for me, at least the songs that have impacted me the most are the songs that I realized I'm not the only one struggling with this feeling or like. Because I think it is um, that I, we've talked about him before. Um, his name is I am Jay Keel. He has a song called, I think it's called Suicidal Thoughts. And it's not necessarily about suicide, but like the way he talks about like his mental health in that song, I identify with a lot of the lyrics. And so through certain things that I've gone through or like things that I've felt, no, having already heard that song, it made me feel a lot better because I knowing you're not alone is a huge, a huge component to mental health. Because once you start being able to play the victim in your own head, then like the world is against you, like life just fucking hates you. So I think it is more, more um, true to being an artist or an artist that's a psychologist to be able to write about things that are darker subject matter because that's what's going to reach your fans. That's what's going to help nice people, people feel better. Yeah. It's a uh, music as group therapy, right? You know what I mean? So if you're right. in a, you're in a group, you yeah, know, exactly. You know, exactly. If you're sitting in a circle with people and that, you know, you're all going through the same thing, you feel better. If you're sitting at home and you put on a record and, you know, somebody is speaking to you, you feel better. It makes a lot of sense. And, you know, right. one thing I was going to say before, too, Karina, when you were you were talking about the feedback you were getting from people, you know, and uh, their suggestions or the requests, you know, um, you know, a lot of that. That's it's like like I saw I'm a guitar player. Right. And I've played playing in bands for 100 years. And um, so I've played a lot, thousands of shows. Right. Bars, but mostly almost entirely bars, a couple of big stages, mostly bars and in bars. Everybody yells at you all the time. Play some scattered, oh, you know, yeah. play this, play that, you know, and, and it, it's the same idea. It's this mentality. It's like the not a, a non artist, right? Isn't going to de to make a dif differentiation between right. an artist and an entertainer. Right. But yeah. when you're, you know, and JLo, I love her too. I mean, she's a great <laughs> actress, actress, great singer, very attractive. I love her, right? <laughs> but she's yeah. an she's an entertainer. She is not right. She's not. She. I mean, I, maybe she would disagree with me. But if you listen to her songs, Jenny from the Block is not. You know, she is not exercising her demons in her songs. You know what I mean? She's just. Don't going, know that, that, bro. You know. <laughs> I don't, I don't know that. that. But, but most of the songs that I've heard right. from J Lo are fun and and upbeat and happy and they're dance and I sure. love them. But she's an entertainer. And Karina, but you're saying. Basically, I you're think, an artist. <laughs> I think know? that, you know, there are places for everyone. I mean, I have a lot of respect for entertainers, you know, but sure. I also have the, the the choice of wanting to be one or wanting to be something, or at least trying right. to be something else. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to obviously to to minimize the the, the quality of entertainers, which I think right. it, Right. It takes a and lot I, of and I, and I, right. I agree. And I was not trying to do that in yeah. any way, you know, because I love a good pop song as much as anybody. And so I am not criticizing that at all. I'm just saying that is the difference. That's what you're explaining. Basically, you're you're approaching your music as an artist and you're not making it in order to entertain the masses. You're exactly. Right. That's what it exactly you uh, are saying it very, very well. <laughs> Um, uh, it's not 
just to entertain the masses. I mean, and well, there are a lot of people out there doing that. And uh, if my listeners, they, they just prefer to, you know, walk away and just, you know, listening to those entertainers, that's fine. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I, I'm not going to change my approach uh, just right. because some people want that uh, from me. I, yeah, I'm starting. I, okay, Gail. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, Go ahead. Some, sometimes I do feel like it takes more balls to be an artist such as yourself and to write about real topics because if whoever's listening right now doesn't do art, like when you make art, you have to kind of absorb it so that you can spit it out, which is what I just said. So when you're writing about subject matters such as domestic abuse and stuff you have to feel that emotion or you're never going to be able to write about it so like for instance you know i'm writing songs about the the war in ukraine right now and that's stuff i don't want in my head but also somebody has to do it you know somebody has to kind of write music for this thing that's going on in the world that hopefully by the time this airs it's over which i don't know if that's going to happen but i'm just saying like it takes bigger guts to be able to dive deep into that place inside yourself because even if you don't think like you wouldn't think behind my song that just came out like that's an edm song like i had to go to a dark place to kind of do it but because i had to listen to all the the in the um what's it called the press releases or whatever of the Ukrainian president talking to come up with it and kind of feel that emotion. It's just very like, I have a lot of respect for you for being able to go into those dark areas of human consciousness to be able to write songs that will be able to affect people that have gone through things like that. Right. So. Yeah, and have and that's a good point, right? Uh, on that uh, on on that subject, Karina, um, have what what are what are some of the 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 positive kind of feedback you've received? So you talk about you know, people right. say, "Hey, give us a dance song," but what about you know, like things people you've helped? You know, things have you heard from people that said, "You know what? That really connected with me." That's interesting. Uh, yes, I mean, um, I also have the. Do- this that kind of feedback um and you know that's the rewarding part of of, of all this and uh, every time i finish a music video and uh, when we finish the shooting all the scenes we always comment if we inspire one person this will this was all worth it because we mm-hmm. put a lot of work in in it in our videos so uh and yes, I received feedback, for example, from women uh, who uh, express uh, their satisfaction because right. I'm talking about a topic that is familiar to them. Mm-hmm. And um, the suicide uh, video as well. In, Which is the song, the song is called The End, right? That's, is that the no, so The End is for the domestic violence. Oh, that's right. Yes, that was right. Like <laughs> the end, because it's like enough is enough, time right. to end right. uh, domestic violence. And I received messages uh, from women, but I can say that uh, from men as well. And I think it's, you know, this was the unexpected because I was expecting women who are victims right. of domestic violence to approach me, uh, that, but also men and men supporting me and supporting me in very different ways. Uh, some because obviously some men are also victims of domestic right. violence, where there is uh, psychological, emotional or even physical. And we need to talk about it as well. And also, uh, for other men, uh, some, they said that although the video uh, is about domestic violence, they see it as uh, someone being in a difficult situation, in a situation that it's time to say enough is enough. Right. And uh, so the video can be interpreted to other situations of abuse. Right. Uh, and not only in a, uh, about domestic violence. And that was very important to me, this feedback 
right? And also, right. And some some men also, you, you know, uh, uh, being supportive about uh, the fact that sure. they were wondering if I was a victim of domestic violence myself. Yeah, some right. of us are, you know, are capable of <laughs> compassion and, and empathy. And, and, <laughs> yeah, and just so that our viewers know, we'll be leaving like the suicide hotline at the bottom of the screen at the end of the video, or maybe not at the box. I don't know. I know the one that I use my. I know whatever. What I usually do is somewhere and and something about domestic abuse. So if you're hearing this and this rings true to you, just go to the end of the video. We'll have links to things you can click on. Yeah, so. what I usually do is put a bit the con- the the dis- the description underneath. Okay, there. so there I'll we put, there we go. I'll put and the suicide helpline and the domestic yeah. abuse helpline. Awesome. Yeah, but she said something that reminded me of myself a second ago, like a lot. Whenever I finish an entire album or one song or an EP, I have my friends and family are always like, are you proud of yourself? And I always say exactly what you said. I said, if this helps one person feel better, even if it's for like the four to five or three, my music is two and a half minutes, sometimes two to five minute long song, you feel better than I did my job. Then mm-hmm. I have done something and I feel that the, the album was a success. Even if it gets two plays, but those two people feel better, that's better than a song that has a million plays and everyone still feels like shit while they're listening to it. I mean, <laughs> that's how I go about it. So that's really, really cool that you think the same way. You I, know? I, you know, I, I like, um, I like that. Like, this is something actually created that I've learned working with Kilo over the last uh, year. Uh, Cause I, I've never, I, I I just do everything instinctively, right? I do everything improv. I don't I don't have a purpose <laughs> for anything I do, right? I just kind of I just create things, you know. What I mean, and that's just just how I do it. And then like six months later, I'll I'll realize what it was I meant when I wrote that song, you know. And right. or I never realized. And then Kilo tells me because you know he's like listening to my stuff, and he's like, before, "Did you? Yeah. Write, yeah, did you write that when you quit drinking?" I'm like, well, shit, yeah. How the hell did you know? That? It's an instrumental. <laughs> how do you know that? You know, I but, do. Yeah, but I mean, like, so I, I just say, I, I guess what I'm getting at is not to talk about my own weird process, but really, I just think that that I admire that notion of like, uh, of having a purpose for your creation, even though, as you said, you don't, you don't start a song saying I'm going to write a song about domestic right. abuse, but you know, once it becomes that, and having, and 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 having, measuring your success by the positive impact that your music can have, I think that's right. beautiful. And uh, and I've never done that <laughs> myself, and I've I'm trying to, I, I'm kind of growing into that now in my old age here. So I appreciate I just that. Giggled because I write like horror music that just sounds terrifying, <laughs> but yet I'm doing it from a place of love and a place of trying to make people feel better. You know, that's why I just giggled to myself, but it's like, yeah, even if you're, even if you're not writing like music about suicide or about the, the hard topics like that, and you come from this place, because I've said to Bob before, and even in the last like month that like, I'm not sure if my music will ever help someone in a positive way and stuff and make them happy because it's so dark. And he was like, no, bro, I understood it right away. So it's like, even though it doesn't necessarily sound like that, the emotion I have when I put my effort into music comes out with the music. What you put in, what comes Well, Karina started this conversation by saying that she was listening to your music and it pumped her up. So there you go. Exactly. And you know (laughs) that I drink like a hundred energy drinks a day. So if (laughs) I did not give out that amount of caffeine vibes with my music, then maybe I'm wrong behind what I'm saying. (laughs) But the fact of the matter is I do drink that many energy drinks and my music does pervade that, that into someone else's mind. There you go. So that leads me to a really good question for Karina is like, what, what impact do you think that music has? on someone's mental health like meaning like a listener not an artist we already know as artists how that works yes uh that's a great question i think music in general uh, can save us um when i say save us it it really can you know and this is uh 
proved scientifically. So the, the th therapeutic effects of music, it can help reduce anxiety, help to improve your mood. And this is documented. Um, obviously, I'm not, I hope that people that are uh, watching this show or will watch the show don't think that obviously if you are severely ill, it doesn't mean that you listen to music and all your right. problems are solved. I'm not trying to say this, but it does have an impact on, on people's lives. Um, right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, and I'm not, no, Bob, that's okay. We're acting like you're not running around your, your room like a madman. I was man. listening. I was listening to Korea. Uh -huh. had, oh, that's okay. That's okay. Feel free. To I, had, I had a cat situation. That's, that's all. A cat. Like. A cat Fair situation. enough. A cat <laughs> But back to what we were saying before yes. Mr. Bob decided to go jogging. <laughs> um, I do. I, I I truly believe that because I come from a metal background. So I played death metal for most of my teenage, well, all of my teenage years, but like most of my young life. And even though that genre, if you think about it and you don't know the genre, like you'll think it's so dark and demonic or bad, that I've never felt more like better about life than when I started listening to that kind of music because mm -hmm. then you get those emotions out right you're not cooped up in your room hating everything and stuff you're you get to feel though like it's weird to say because it's like it's negative vibe but a positive vibe but you get to like kind of just Feel that for that moment. So then when you're done listening to the song, you're no longer pissed off at the world, you know? So Yeah, I have been educating myself about uh, metal uh, because I, I, my producer, he's in uh, heavy metal. He loves uh, heavy metal. And, you know, I have been educating myself and I think it's, uh, it's, it, it's a beautiful thing if, if, if you think that, Okay, this can sound a bit, you know, scary, uh, but right. in fact, no, when I, sorry if it's not the best word, but in fact. No, 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 it's the best word. That's perfect <laughs> word. That sounds it's, scary. It's like a, a, a catharsis. So right. you express uh, your right. all, of, all of your emotions through music. And if you do it that way, it's much better than, you know. Right. Going out and getting in a fist fight or something. Right. It's yeah. like, and I'll tell you, I've played with most of the, the big bands in the genre of metal that I played. And um, they're some of the nicest and happiest people I've ever met. Yes, it's true. I, it's true because, so. you know, because of my producer, I have now that experience. And he tells me the same about people in metal. So I have deep respect. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Sometimes so, I, yeah. I, Sometimes I joke with, with my producer when he he, he posts o, o, on Instagram and I, I do like a smiley, scared, you know, a scared smiley, but I'm just <laughs> kidding with him. But right, right. I like it. <laughs> so why don't you go into telling us about your producer, like about um, the production process, the songwriting process? Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, I'm invested in... Uh, uh, lyrics but I also like to create melodies but the way I create melodies is like my my partner Rui uh, who is you know this project is not about myself it's me and my life partner Rui right. uh, I give my face but you know this is not about me basically because we create together uh, we write the songs the lyrics and we write the melodies uh, many of the melodies are, are created uh, by Rui and, uh, you know, I want to give his, I think he's downstairs with our son. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I also like to create melodies, but the way I create is like he does uh, chords, she plays chords mm -hmm. and I create a melody on top because I'm not a, a, a very good m musician. Uh, so uh, that's how I create melodies but I love uh, what I like the most maybe is to write lyrics and then once we have a song the lyrics and uh, the melody we go to the studio where we meet with uh, James Arthur our, our producer and we transform uh, this idea th these lyrics and this melody in a, in a song uh, with our producer 
and That's he very... he's so amazing. I, uh, he plays a lot of instruments very well, you know. So I, you know, no man is an island and no woman is an island. I don't right. do anything right. alone, That's and that's their merit. And I want to acknowledge that uh, they they help me and they do this with me. That's cool, and that's what a lot of people don't understand. Like what well, you just said, no man is an island. Like people think you can do it all yourself. But for instance, like I produce Bob's record for him, right? Like mm-hmm. it's not, or like I mean, I I kind of do it mostly myself, which I wish sometimes I did not. But whatever. I'm my point being for the majority of people, but even to that extent, like Bob helps me, for instance, with the the newest um the newest song i just came out with it took a tribe of people to help me come up with the parts of the president's speech that i would use for the song for ukraine it took us figuring out how to translate what he was saying that was fucking hard to put (laughs) to put words that i don't know what they're saying in the correct sample i'm gonna put them in the correct place so even to the extent of me who just said I do it mainly myself, I don't because Bob right. always gives me advice. Even if someone's not sitting there beside you, patting your back and saying, I'll write the chords for you. Yeah. Like you're constantly talking to others and like kind of coming up with the ideas and maybe this will work for this place and this will work for that place, even if you write it yourself. So I'm well, being- And I can tell you, I'll give you an example too of my own life, right? I mean, I'm a, you know, I've been making music for 30 years and and most of that time, most of the music I've made, I've worked completely on my own. Right. So I, I write the songs, I play all the instruments and I record them and mix them and master them, do the whole thing myself. And I did some really good stuff that way. But but the best music I've ever made has been with I've got a band. I've got this band Shoe that I've been playing right. with since the 90s. And I've got the music I make with Kilo. And those two entities are far and away the best, the best music I've ever made. And, and it, the, the collaborations that I, that I've, uh, I've, uh, you know, put together with, with good friends and, uh, and it, you know, I've, that's yeah. taught me a lot. This, this, this experience with Kilo has taught me so much about my own, my own artistry and my own creative process and, and what I'm capable of and, and, and how I'm capable of it, right? Because it's because you're you're capable of so much more by working with others, by working with other people right. that you trust, you love, respect, and I trust and love and respect oh, well, my friend Kilo. So there you go. As a matter of <laughs> fact, now that I think about it, most of the music I've been writing lately actually is with Bob. So I do do it all with like right someone on. else now. I mean, I have a few singles here and there that come out of my own music, but yeah, I'll be like, hey, bro, you need to do another guitar part for this one song or whatever. And so, yeah, I agree, bro. Like writing it with other people to those who don't make music right now or want to make music, whatever, is just another way of expanding how talented you are. Right, exactly. Because you could come up with a melody and think it's dope, but you're not even hearing it the right way. Like this, this next song for the war that I've been writing, I thought there was one note in there in my in my ear brain it was in there i was hearing it a certain way but when i looked at the the mini track it wasn't even in there so it's like (laughs) sometimes you're listening to something you think it sounds one way because that's how you intended on writing it Mm -hmm. but that's not what you're actually the listener's going to hear so yeah it's it's very very um relevant to work with other people which is obviously a very hard thing to do that's not the easiest I've had a million people fuck yeah. me over. It depends on the people. Yeah, I mean, right. I, to be honest, I wouldn't be able to make music with people that I don't like personally, but that's because, you know, uh, it's so it's so special to me, the music that I do. And uh, so I like to to share it and uh, to right. co-create it with people that I, I like uh, because I, I want it to be a... a a nice experience when I'm in the studio. Right I like on. to enjoy it. Yeah, it's the best right. time ever. Want you want to have it. fun with it. Yeah, the studio is the best. You want to be hanging out with people you like and and having fun. I mean, it should and, be fun and and feeling safe as well. When I say safe, it uh, is because 
because right. I don't do music every day. And, uh, you know, I'm not, and I assume with no, you know, that I have no problem to assume I'm not the best musician in the world, not the, the most talented. So for me, um, being in a safe space where people don't judge me and just uh, make, uh, they are able to take the best of me. Uh, it's fantastic. That's awesome. That's very cool. Very the cool. one thing that we usually always like to talk about on our show is inspiration, right? And I just would like to know, I would like to know personally, but also I'd like our fans to know, like, how do you keep yourself inspired? Like, how did your inspira inspiration giving process look like? That's a, such a great question, but it I don't do anything to to keep the inspiration it's very spontaneous is for example something that i that i experience myself for example the next song that i'm going to release uh, i wrote the lyrics in one afternoon and i was devastated in that day i was like emotionally devastated right. And so I, I wrote a song about that because I was being bullied by this person. I wrote these lyrics in 2017. I'm just, I'm going to record the song next month, but the lyrics were written in 2017. Mm -hmm. And I was being bullied by this person for some time. And so at, at that point, I just wrote a song about it. And the, the song is, uh, the title is Bully. It's it's something that I wanted to tell that person, but I couldn't. I didn't have the courage to tell the person, so I just wrote the song, and that's my inspiration comes from these experiences and the domestic violence. It's quite personal as well. Uh, the suicide one is it's quite personal, not so directly as the domestic violence, but because I I know people who. Whose uh, parent, who one of the the parents uh, died due to suicide. So, mm -hmm. um, one of my best friends, my childhood best friends, his father uh, lost his life's his life to suicide, and so all of these experiences uh, inspire my my music. And to to be honest, it's it's quite interesting and, and meaningful because when I did the music video about suicide and because my best friend, one of my ch best childhood friends, he had this ex direct ex experience with losing uh, his father to suicide. I was, you know, very nervous about what he's going to think that I'm now doing this video about suicide. And he really liked it. And he even shared on his Facebook page because he knows, he acknowledged that um, it's important that we talk about this. Right. The more right. awareness that we raise, the better because right. we need to talk about it because we can save lives. Some people, they are afraid of talking about these topics and, for example, about suicide because they think if you talk about suicide, you can inspire people to commit suicide we don't yeah. use the word commit uh, i'm sorry because you know i don't know if uh, you are aware that we shouldn't be using the word com commit because commit is associated with a crime and obviously su right. suicide right. is not a crime but when we talk about suicide it's the other way around we are actually raising awareness and some people may actually ask for help seeing the video mm -hmm. um because they'll and find because they'll find that connection that we were talking about. That connection, you know? exactly. That, that like, hey, there you go. This is, you know, and that and that that idea, right? That idea that you're right, like you're writing about things that are personal to you, whether they're in your life or in your friends' lives or whatever. But right. once you put it out there, you realize it reminds me of something Kilo said in a couple episodes ago when we were talking about we talk about. Uh, about philosophy and like Buddhism and, and stuff a lot because that's what we're into. Love it as well. <laughs> yeah, all right, on cool. So anyway, so Akilo, you, you can tell the story better, Akilo. But if that story that you told about Lord how God. the Buddha, uh, well, somebody asked the Buddha how how to how could they um, how could they cope with their grief? Somebody had died and they didn't know how to cope with grief, oh, and the Buddha said to go, right. you know. Well, 
Right. Yeah, no. Ahead. Yeah. The Buddha said, no, the story is this, this lady lost her on like her one child and she didn't even think she could have kids. And so um, she was like grief stricken and basically crazy carrying around this corpse saying like, can you bring back my child? And um, the, one of the townspeople said, well, if anyone can bring him back, the Buddha can't, right? So she goes to the Buddha and she's like, bring back my son. And then the Buddha's all like, okay, I'll do that. If you can go, just go out and go to 10 different households that have not experienced death in the family or in the household or know of death and, and come back with a mustard seed from each house. And then I will bring your son back. And she went around frantically asking people over and over and every single person had the same response of like, I'm sorry, I wish I could help you. I want you to have your son back, but we've experienced death. You know, we know this feeling. And um, she eventually went back to the Buddha and was like telling him like, I couldn't find anyone. And that he was, <laughs> I always think that's funny, but he was like, that's the point. Like everyone experiences this. You know, and I think, Bob, your point was that, like, when we can talk about things and realize we're not alone, is that what you were getting at? That's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, so like the the person uh, and I'm not saying you, Karina, but but I'm saying what any any artist that does what you're doing, right, where you write something personal and you might feel when you're writing it even that, you know, you're alone. This is your own. You're this is just something you're feeling and nobody else feels that. And and, you know, this is all you can do. But then when people hear it, then then, you know, then it's very clear that you're not alone at all. And well, I remember. Yeah. No, yeah, that brings me back to something I haven't even remembered to bring up on this show. Back when I was a teenager um, and I was a drummer, um, I heard an interview by a band called Sugar Cult. I don't know if you'd consider them emo or just like rock and roll or whatever. And they were talking about how (laughs) one of their shows, they had this drunk ass guy in the front row, like booing them the entire show. Like they were like, they were like, they said he was like cussing at him. And I, I think they said it was like on some TV show too. But anyways, point being, they, um, they said, but when they got off stage, one of the, um, one of the people in the audience came up to them and, and said like, your lyrics have helped me. And <laughs> sorry, I'm not going to tear up like I always do. <laughs> no, it's, uh, but someone said like, your lyrics showed me that I was not alone. Right. And that like, I could be okay because they do write kind of emo lyrics. So maybe they are an emo band, whatever. I like emo music. It's fine. Um, But the, that was the moment I decided that I wanted to do music because like realizing that like you can have that profound of an impact on people where like you've never come in contact with them in your entire life yet they will come up to you after a show and go like, you've made me not kill myself. Because I think that's what the girl said to them with like, I right. was suicidal, but then I was listening to your music. And I realized like through hearing your shitty stories, like the stories about life being hard and like being upset, it made me realize I'm not alone in this feeling. I mean, that's really what music is about is in a way you know, making people, I mean, there's two forms of doing it, right? You can either do, I guess, kind of like what I do, which is give people like energy and make them excited or make them feel like it's okay to feel shitty right now. You know, like I like song, me personally, I like songs that are about like drug addictions and stuff because I've gone through that in my life. And I've had songs like that help me in those moments of like, withdrawing from methadone like just over and over again listening to those songs just constantly and that's the impact that we can have as musicians as an artist of any sort it's making people realize like we're all on this planet together but we're not just like one man on an island going through all these shitty things while everyone else is enjoying themselves you know so anyways right on man you're making a lot of good points. And uh, one of them is that I, I don't like when people um, 
I don't know how I will say, uh, undermine artists like saying, why don't you get the real job? Because artists <laughs> right. have real jobs and uh, jobs with a, a huge impact. Right. And um, well, thank you so much for, you know, rate rating that, you know, what artists do is 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 a real job it it's it has a lot of impact on people's lives so and um thank you for 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 saying that that's awesome well that just that that goes back to why i wrote the song about what's going on in ukraine right now because i felt because i don't know if karina knows this but our fans know that i can't walk right so when this whole thing happened and i was like i want to help I I felt very um I felt fucked because I can't go over there and like exactly. either fight people or like give people aid or food or whatever or I would literally be there right now. But um I felt like at least I can write music that will make people feel better. So it's like yeah, I mean it does have a huge impact on people because we just talked about that depending on what you listen to can really change your mood throughout the day. Like if I'm in a bad mood and I want to be in a better mood, I listen to a fun song that's about like going out and having a party, like, because that will change my mental status from like dwelling on my negative. There's two ways of going about it. You can listen to a negative song so then you don't have to feel so negative and you feel better, but also you can listen to, just a party song so that then your mind isn't thinking about those negative thoughts that you have. Right. So yeah, yeah, you're totally right. Music has a huge impact on everybody all the time. Right on. So, anyway, so back to music, why don't you tell us what you have for your fans in the coming days? Like what are you working on right now? Yeah. What's next, Karina? Yeah. Yeah. It's bully. Uh, I'm oh, going yeah, bully, right? Yeah. Bully. I have an, a song that it's almost done as well, which is called Last Time. Very, very meaningful to me as well. Um, in and we have a, a lot of songs in, in the process of uh, you know, we are writing and creating the melodies, but at least uh, bully and last time, uh should be out sometime soon well cool. very cool so, okay so this comes to the part of the show where we ask you or we te- we we give you the opportunity to say anything you want to say and it doesn't have to do with it it doesn't have to have to do with anything we talk about it doesn't have to do with music it can be anything what do you want to say to whoever's listening right now on the podcast anything anything that i want to say Anything. Mm, that's or nothing. You don't have to say anything. You can make fun of my hair. You want to make fun of my hair? Sure. I want <laughs> to make fun of your hair. That I read yesterday and I found very interesting. Okay. It's just that something that I found very interesting. I hope that the fans of the show maybe find it interesting as well. Is is the following. Uh, I think that Western co- uh, cultures, uh, we think that uh, we need to achieve things in life to um, to have value, to be worthy as, right. as people. We, we think that we need to achieve fame, money, um, things. A good job, big car, good big job. house, all that, yeah. But what I want to say is that we, sh- we should feel um, that we are like nature. We just need to exist and be here to be whole. There you go. Right on. To be yeah, present in the moment, right? Yes. Definitely yes. as very big practitioners of Buddhism, we definitely agree with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. So we definitely think that all the time is the right, the right way to go about living. So, okay, now we come to my favorite part of the show where we're going to do, it's like a round robin. We're each going to ask a question and we each have to answer it. So if you're going to ask a question that you don't want to answer, probably pick a don't different question. It, right? <laughs> so yeah. One of us, um, I think this time Bob's going to ask the industry question, okay. right? Or, uh, sure. or not maybe. I got uh, it. One I, of I, the hosts yeah. is going to ask an industry question and one is going to ask just a normal 
life question mm -hmm. just so our audience can get to know you more as a person and stuff. And then you get to ask a question that we have to answer. So be, you know, you can bait us into having to answer anything you're willing to answer. So, um, Bob, do you want me to go first today or you go first? No, I'll go. I'll go. Um, let's see what, um, what was the first song you ever recorded in your life? Like sure. that you can remember the first time you heard yourself in a recording. Wait, do we have to know the name of the song? No, just the experience, whatever. You don't have, I don't care okay. about the title, but just like, like okay. that, that moment where you, the first time you heard yourself like played back, you know, and it doesn't have to I be. Remember I remember. Song. I remember. Okay. Well, go ahead. <laughs> It's about uh, a city. The song is about a city called Coimbra, which is the city where I, I studied. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a city that it's like, I would say, you know, um, you know, Cambridge and Oxford, which are the cities of, of students mm -hmm. focused on universities and the students' life. So Coimbra is a city in Portugal that revolves around uh, students' lives. So I remember that I was in this music group and that I, I, I was singing this song and then someone recorded it and then I, I heard it. Like and uh, yeah, it was like the Coimbra tenho para contar. It well, that's started. awesome. That was fun. I think you should re-record <laughs> that. I yeah, think you should put that. that song out again. Yes. You should do it again. That's a great idea. No, I okay, got cool. very nervous when I. It is that, that's the sh just the first phrase of, of the song, but I, I I was nervous. <laughs> But it's as you may uh, have understood, it's Portuguese. Yes, well, yeah. that, that part we got. Yeah, <laughs> we understood that. Um, okay, Bob, are you talking like on like a video camera well, or like a as, recording? As you know, like, right? Whenever I ask these uh, questions, I leave them wide open to interpretation. So I don't care well, okay. if it was on I, video or you know the title or whatever. Just I want to know that I, experience. Originally, I interpreted it as a recording, not a video. Okay, so. Well, yeah, I was talking about audio recordings, really. But, you know, whatever you got. Okay, okay. Uh, video is um, fine. I, I remember, and I, that why I, didn't, why I didn't know the name of the song is because we recorded an EP. But my band back in Tulsa, Oklahoma, like my original band called Forever Mind, which is a weird name, but I, I still really enjoyed that band. Um, we booked like some studio time in the really nice studio because there's a few really nice studios in Tulsa um and we booked studio time in in that studio one of the better studios there and I remember why I remember this why I'm even telling the story like this is because we were recording and little did I know that the producer and the guy who like owned the studio had called two or called one band member from the band Bowling for Soup who was in town that night, right, to play the show. Right. It was like telling him about like recording me. So the drummer from Bowling for Soup and the drummer from the, the rock band Seether came out and watched me record like my very first recordings ever. Wow, and I was that's like, cool. Yeah, right. And they were like, "Oh, you you got really good time." They were really nice people, and it's just like that's why I remember it because I don't right. remember much. I still have the photo. <laughs> I'll send it to you sometime, Bob. But it's just like. You know, the, those are the cool moments. You know, also, that's, that's the cool part about being in a wheelchair and being a drummer, like where it's like people are like, wait, this is fucking yeah. happening. <laughs> How's he doing you know, that? Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> like, I love trolling people at my shows as the DJ because, like, they don't think it's going to be a crippled DJ, right? So, like, I'll just be around in the crowd, like, being crazy with my shirt off, just yelling, screaming, <laughs> enjoying myself. And I just, and I, sorry, I'll tell the story real fast. I remember when I did, when I headlined the um, show for Icon, the collective I'm part of, I did the same thing. And most of the people in the club were from Icon, so they knew who I was. And they, they like thought, like, oh yeah, it's, it's Kilo being Kilo. But like, I, I was doing that. And then I get up on stage, like right, right when I get up on stage, I look down, there's these two, guys who just like basically just got off a plane from 
England, actually. That's funny. Um, but from England, and they their faces were pure like, what the fuck? Because they're just thinking I'm just this dude that's just having a good time, right? And then they see that I'm the headlining act of the night. And it's, anyways, so that was just a great experience to be like, wow, like people actually are enjoying that I'm playing drums. Because to me, go, it's just man. me playing the drums. I don't think about it as like, oh, I'm crippled and yeah. playing the drums. It's just, to me, it's just playing the drums. Right so on. what about you, Bob? Uh, well, let's see. I, I'm, I'm looking around for a reason. Because I wanted to show you guys something. Oh, there it is. Hold on a second. <laughs> Are you lost, bro? No, no, no. no, so as I always talk, I always talk about how the fact that I'm 100 years old. I'm not really. I'm 51 years old. And I was, uh, I grew up in the 80s. And in the 80s, I, I had a little four track in my bedroom. And I used to record all the time. I've been recording my entire life, really, as long as I could figure it out. And this is my MT100 four track wow. cassette oh, recorder That's yeah this awesome. is <laughs> it's actually the second one i bought I, my original one i don't know where it is oh, but nice. i bought this one years later but anyway that i recorded hundreds i mean hundreds of songs terrible songs but <laughs> but, but, but i love them on he that was an example exactly and i've got boxes and boxes of cassettes that i recorded on that thing 30 years ago i still have all the tapes so oh that's so nice yeah so there's not a particular moment but there's a there's a part of my life that is you know it's it's inseparable from my my identity that right that it's i didn't expect to get emotional about it but yeah recording is very important so let me just take a minute to point out to people who are musicians that songs mean so much to artists like what you just said because it's like a snapshot of where they were at the moment right. but it's like as if you could just take a picture of every emotion you're feeling at that stage in your life and then look at it 10 years later that's why he's pointing it out like that that he's inseparable we're all inseparable from right. the music that we write at a certain time because the music i write now not to be dark, but because of this whole war thing affecting me so much, it's yeah. never really gonna be, you know, it's gonna right. always be a little a little different just because of one experience that happened in the world, I'm never gonna really be able to. So when I look mm-hmm. back at music before this happened, I will look at it and go, Well, fuck, I totally didn't know what life, you know, like <laughs> I yeah. didn't know that life could be so brutal, you know, yeah. basically. So, okay, my turn. Oh, yeah, yeah, we have another. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, we have two more, but my <laughs> turn. Um, okay, I was thinking, and, and obviously this will just be, this question is just meaning in your opinion, but my question is, what is the secret to happiness? I guess, Karita, I think you'll go first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So your question is, what is the secret to be happy? Yeah, yeah like in your opinion, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what? That's like a saying. I don't know if they say that in Portugal, but that's like a saying in America. Like the secret to happiness is drink more water, or I don't know. You know, right. people always have a theory of like why, what makes you happy, or do you want one of us to answer first? Or yes. So, you, so you, you mean in Europe, the the secret to happiness? No, in, I, no, no to I, you. I think it's in just your, a, in your right. opinion. Yeah. Right. What in does you. a what does a, a person need in life to sure. live a happy yeah. to have a happy life? What do we need as as humans? So yeah. oh, <laughs> sorry. Right. Okay, I was not under. Yes, as humans. Okay. Um, um, I think that uh, uh, my I can share my personal perspective here yes, yes. Uh, do we really live uh, to be happy uh, because uh, in my perspective we we live to to have meaning and meaning here means that you will have happiness and you will also experience um sadness because right. all the emotions are part of life and i think right. we should all embrace all the emotions so what I want from life is not exactly happiness, but it's meaning and acknowledging that I, right. I will experience 
right. all of the emotions. Fulfillment more so than, Fulfillment, than, than exactly. happiness. Right. That's it's interesting. Like that you know, that's interesting too, because it's um, you know, because that's that your question, Kilo, is like, you know, it is the uh it's sort of the basic the basis of philosophy, right? Like what do people need right. in order to make their brains right. work and to be happy with it? And and the and Karina's answer is awesome because it's it's it, it dives right into that, like what the, the different philosophies about that, because like because the idea that like we're here to be happy, that's because everybody like that's hedonism, right? And hedonism, Hed right? And, and hedonism, right? Right? And people. I, like, I don't right. know what the right way to pronounce because my, <laughs> you know, it's 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 with my accent. <laughs> yeah, no, it depends, it depends on the, uh, geographically where you are, I guess. But but the but the idea is the same, right? It's this this notion that we exist to be happy that people now in, in modern times hedonism, right. hedonism has turned into you know, sort of debauchery you know what i mean like hedonists are are drunkards and, and sex feeds and everything else but really it's a there's an actual philosophy behind it and it is that 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 you know we're here to be happy there are other philosophies that you know, that say we're here to have purpose uh, or to, to self actualization and things like that. So it's it's very interesting. It's interesting how your question, Kilo, exactly self actualization. Was, uh, like, what exactly? exactly. I, you know, right. I'm. Uh, if we think about, I don't know if you know the the pyramid or mm -hmm. the Maslow pyramid of yeah. uh, needs, the human needs that yeah. starts with the base, with the base, right. uh, you know, food and uh, you know water, and then you uh, when you start to go up the the pyramid, then you want to feel safe, and then at the top you want self actualization. Yeah. Um, so I think it's in line with uh, what we are talking about. Uh, See, I did that on purpose, by the way. I threw, no, I, I threw, I, I threw a cycle. I threw a no. psychology term in there because I knew that Karina would start talking about it. <laughs> I, I, self -actualization. Think, though, I do think that that statement, the way people word that is stupid, right? Because I heard one guy say once, I think it was on a podcast, that um, joy and happiness are a different thing. And this is going back to something Karina just said, um, and because he said happiness is an emotion Joy is the state of being. And he said, you can be having a shitty day and be upset about stuff and still have joy. But happiness is something that comes and goes throughout the day, depending on a phone call, depending on. So, yeah, I guess that's more of what I meant. It's like what brings joy. But anyways, Bob, you never answered it. You I just I, um, I didn't know. No, we just had Karina's answer. So what you want my answer? What? Uh... Yeah. What was the question again? How do we be happy? <laughs> what do we yes, need to be happy? Yes, that's the question for you now. Exactly. That's the question. Well, yes. Okay. What do we need to be happy? Um, I think. No, that my I mean, just take it for what it is, but yeah. more of the staying of like the meaning or the, the whatever I said. Yeah, no, I, I, I get it. I, I get what you're asking. Um, and I, yeah. I think that my answer would be that my answer changes frequently on this or over the years my answer has changed um you know if you had asked a, a a 25 year old or 30 year old bob what he needed to be happy he would probably say something about you know being alone <laughs> you know what i mean like that's what i would say sure. i'd be like i want to be alone in a studio i probably would have said like you know with some beer and some smokes and a guitar or something you know that's what it, that's what right. 25 year old bob would say you know, 50 year old Bob would say basically the exact opposite. You know what I mean? Well, except right. I want to be in the studio, which is where I am now. And this is where I spend most right. of my time. Yeah. So that part's true, but I don't want to be alone. I don't want to, you know, I, I want to, right. uh, I want to connect with the world now, you know? So mm -hmm. that's, that's what I think. I think connecting that's with others. Very important. Yeah. Connection. It's, it's so. funny because Human usually I'm, I'm the one with the vaguer answers to questions that Bob will and our audience will definitely <laughs> agree. I'm the one that always gives like a philosophical answer behind things. Right? <laughs> yeah, but for once, both of you have better answers than me, but I do have an answer. Um, I have been told, and I think Bob will definitely attest to this because we talk like every two hours or something all throughout the day, that I'm one of the happiest people I've had. Most of my friends tell me I'm one of the happiest people they've ever met, yet they're like, you can't walk or walk well or whatever. Like, yeah, you're so happy, right? And, and they always ask me, like, what I just asked. What's the secret to happiness? 
in my opinion, and this is a personal opinion, and this encompasses lots of things, is don't take life too seriously. Like, that's what chokes. Joy is, or happiness is around you at all times, but we choke it. We just kind of neutralize it by taking life too seriously. We I just, love your, both your answers, actually. I yeah. totally agree with that. Right on. I Good mean, answer. I you. mean, that is the answer to why I'm such a happy person is because I don't, because I realize when I'm dead and my grandkids and great grandkids are dead, Kilo or and and the music that I make is no longer relevant and everything like Kilo House didn't matter. Like, and that's not saying that in a bad way. I'm saying that in a good way where I don't take everything so seriously that then I can't be happy. You know, right. like at the end of the day, when I'm on my deathbed, am I gonna care if I could walk up a flight of stairs? No, I'm not gonna care. Like, but yet people look at their lives and they go, you know. They look at me and they say, like, oh, well, you can't even walk. How are you so happy? Because I don't give a shit if I can walk. <laughs> There's so much more to think about. Just but that's, don't that's take it so life serious. Advice. Yeah, sure. That's, that's, that's quite advice, honestly. Um, <laughs> It, because the, the the question could be, what would be the best advice that you would give to someone? And I think that's, you know, that's so important. That's funny, because that's what I would, that was my other question I would have asked if I could have. Like, if well, I was debating between the two, it was going to be, if you could give someone one piece of advice, what would it be? But I thought I already used that on the show, so I wasn't going <laughs> to re, redo that question. That's so that's funny. exactly right. That's exactly I That's should... really just how you go about it. It's like, guess what? If you get a flat tire today, it's not the end of the world. Like if you, even if you get got fired today and you're listening to this show, what do you think being in a bad mood is going to do for you to get you a new job? It's not. It's going to choke the lifeblood out of your fucking existence. And you're not going to get another yeah. job very easily because you're going to be a negative Nancy. Like, I don't think I would have even done music if I was negative because I've had a lot of people say to me, like, you could sit there and just hate your life for the rest of your life. And I wouldn't judge you because you can't even walk. And I'm like, yeah, but I wouldn't be a DJ. I wouldn't be yeah. a producer. I wouldn't be a drummer. I wouldn't be a longboard skater. Like, I mean, you know, so yeah, just fuck it. Don't take life so seriously. Right on. Anyways, man. that's my little speech yeah. about life. Okay, now you get to ask a question. We have to answer it, and then you have. Well, you, you, your questions are so good. Were so good that now I feel, um, you know, <laughs> I didn't know that. Uh, you know, when I was invited to the show, I didn't know that it would be so good that it it oh, would be so the... so deep. Thanks. So that was so good. Um, we are so, definitely deep people. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's true. That's, yeah. that's yeah. So we are part of the same tribe, which is great. So well, I, I uh, should tell you, Karita, by the way, a spoiler alert. Kilo was raised by a doctor of psychology, his oh, father. A psychiatrist. Psychiatrist. No, psychiatrist. Yeah. Related, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's definitely not um, a normal, like, just take these pills and go, <laughs> yeah, right, go yeah. home. People always say it's like the house. If you know the show House, it's like the doctor that can figure everything out. He's the house of psychiatry is what his peers tell him because he can take like someone that seems like they have one problem and then he'll find out like he'll figure out that they actually have like undiagnosed something else. Like this one patient he had, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to say where he works or anything. So I think it's good. Like, which is a very angry person and stuff. And everyone didn't want to treat him. And they were like, always had like problems and so finally they came he came to my dad well my dad realized through dealing with me having adhd that adhd untreated without taking any medicine for it or trying to deal with it can make you very angry and they had tried all this other stuff for that one patient well guess what they my dad gives him adhd medicine and it makes him not a pissed off fuck that's just right. mad at everyone and just wants to destroy everyone and it's just like yeah so my dad's not a normal psychiatrist where it's just like take the pills i tell you and go home and be yeah. happy he's more of like a psychologist yeah, right. where it's like that's, he helps them figure out right so, anyway right. 
Yeah. So anyway, I, 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 I apologize. I derailed your question there, Karina, but yeah, yeah, I yeah, wanted yeah. to point that out. So you go ahead. Uh, so my question now, right? Yes. Um, yes. So uh, how would you define um, yourself I, I, with one word? If you could choose one word to define oh, yourself, <laughs> what word. word would you choose? Wow, that's tough. Uh, I think Kilo has to answer first. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, come on, bro. Um, I just came up with this question now. It was I like not- it. I like it. It's hard, but it uh but I like it. Well, I guess I know the um well come on, bro. You really want me to do right, no, I'll go. you know, I'll go. I mean, I you know, I think it's a that's I, I mean it's tough. Such that's an impossible question, question but it's it, such but a great, good question that great. it's hard. Well, well, the reason it's hard to answer is because you can't, right? So what you're really going right. to do, what I, what you're doing, what I'm doing, right? What we're trying to do is figure out what part of ourselves do we want to describe? You know what I yeah, mean? Like what? Is, no, because what we is, are so many things. Yeah, like, but something that you feel that it's strong about you. Not it doesn't it oh, right. doesn't describe you completely. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I could. You know, this will sound. I, I don't, no matter what I say, I'm going to probably sound arrogant because I am. <laughs> I guess, but. <laughs> But, uh, but hopefully you don't say something well, negative. No, not negative. No, uh, but it's, I, it's not arrogant. Then. If if there's anything I got going for me in my life, right? Like if they're the, my saving grace, as it were, is that I'm uh, I'm a smart guy. I'm pretty smart, right? I've That's done great. I've I've done well in in life by by being smart. You know, not not by well being, done. Right. So there you go. I think you are a smart guy. So uh, that's great. Well, thank you. I I don't know. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's uh, but 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 thinking of myself as a smart person has worked for me. So uh, Uh, there you go. That's a good way to put it as well. Right. So there you go. I'm smart. Uh, I'm also and I'm also insane and I'm disorganized and a lunatic and just all kinds of weird. But (laughs) but okay. That's exactly why I didn't answer right away because insane would be the immediate answer, but because she's a psychologist, she would take that literally. So no. I couldn't say it like that. Because okay, my I do know an answer. But what were you going to say? Uh, so I, I was just uh, going to say that if, even if you say that you are insane, that's all right because I don't believe that anyone in this world is totally sane. So we are all amen. Exactly. She knows, but I did. Luckily, Bob, you stalled long enough that I did come up (laughs) with a wonderful answer. Um, And I'll tell you why. Um, I would say it's two words, but whatever. Unexperienced. And that comes back to a friend of mine once, like one day we were like driving down the street and like going to do some crazy thing to do. And my friend was like, bro, like, if it weren't for you, like I'd still be just sitting in my bedroom eating Cheetos, playing video games. And you're an experience. And the point of that is like when you do anything around me or with me, it's going to be crazy. It's not going to be normal. It's not. It's just going to be something that you will always remember and talk about because I just am because I know how to live life. Right. Like that's great. I, I, I don't like drink or stuff like that, but I know how to take any experience that's like boring or mundane. And even if it's just because I fell off the scooter and it's funny, like it becomes something you remember for the rest of your life, like a good, like an experience. So that's me. I love, I'm an experience. You are. I love your answer. So yes. what about you, Karina? Yes. You have to answer. I think mine would be uh, truth. Well, I, like truth. I, I think uh, everything that I, I do, I do it with uh, uh, truth. And I'll, um, I think I'm authentic. authentic. Um, what you see, I think it's what I, not that I actually what you see, it's what you get. So I think it's a word that describes me. Well, you, what, you want to know? You want to know something? Agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I want to know something. It's funny. <laughs> I'm not funny. It's cool. That you said that, but. Uh, Earlier in this episode, when we were talking, I, I one thing I was going to say, and I didn't just because, you know, we were having a conversation and it just didn't, didn't fit in, was that I, you know, even though you and I, have, as we said at the beginning, you and I have been talking via email for years or whatever and, and, and everything else, but never spoken. But I, um, I haven't been surprised 
in speaking with you. I, that, I, by that, I mean, you are what I expected you to be. And that's a compliment yeah. because I expected you to be well, awesome. You so and you are awesome. Well, thank so. you so much. No, but I'm, no, but I'm glad. I'm, I'm not even talking about the awesome part because that's <laughs> relatable. But I'm glad that I am how you imagine it because yes. that means that that's how I probably come across right you're putting other... yourself out there accurately you are you know you are authentic that, that's not that, only that's that, that but means. like i've never talked to her in even an email and just by listening to her music i agree with what you're saying right on she is the person that her music would make you think she would be so you you, you definitely answered the question right yeah Absolutely. yeah you probably did it better than the rest of us because i you know Right. No, you you are much better at this than myself. Yeah. And, you know, you are more experienced in this uh, kind of conversation as well. Uh, it was a, a real pleasure. And, I'm, you know, I feel, uh, you know, honored uh, to have been invited. Considering, That's awesome. considering my thing says, help fuck on it, we're not as experienced <laughs> as you think we are. That's Just funny. pointing that out. You said we're experienced. No, <laughs> I think that was the best part because, you know, you, how do we say, um, uh, how, how, what this expression, you broke the ice. So oh, you, yeah. I, sure, I read sure. the help fuck and I, you know, I, <laughs> I just, <laughs> I, I, I don't if know our why. Audience doesn't, if you're not watching this and you're listening to the podcast, oh, yeah, when I joined a Zoom call, apparently at some point when we were trying to figure out how to run Zoom calls for me, <laughs> because I'm not completely smart, I apparently I typed that as my name. Yeah. So when we joined this call with this wonderful lady, it just said, help fuck. So <laughs> and now we can't figure out how to get rid of it. <laughs> example of the experience thing right there that's me be that validates what i just said which <laughs> yes, is i'm an experience because yeah. you're never gonna forget the time you had a zoom never you forget you. There yeah you it's, it's, it's so amazing it's hilarious uh it was hilarious it. i i mean <laughs> I, i'm yeah loved i mean it. i have no idea how that happened but i didn't i didn't want it to go away because i was like people are I, that it's, that's it's fantastic but do you I know, know but it's a very nice, uh, you know, story. Um, if you if you don't mind, it's a nice story for me to tell. You know, when, like early days, like some years ago, I was in a podcast with uh, exactly. Bob and Kilo, and uh, Kilo had like help fuck. So it, <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that. I know. And at first, you were like, "You got to change your name, bro," and I'm like, "Wait, what is he talking about?" Oh, I wasn't awesome. even paying attention to it. So. Yeah. Okay, everybody, thank you for watching or listening to the program. We'll have the suicide prevention hotline number and the and the abuse, domestic abuse. Yes, the domestic yeah. abuse hotline and and we'll leave a link to some of the videos that we talked about of hers. And mm-hmm. I I very much hope you have a wonderful evening, day, or it's even, it is it's, it's about 10 o'clock at night there is it not, not, no, it's, uh, it's, it's almost nine it's like yeah. 30 it's like 30 right, I'm, right. I'm very sorry if i didn't sound uh, very elaborate but you no, know it's it's friday night after like a long week but right. hopefully uh, your fans the fans of the show will apollo will forgive me um you were wonderful. No, you did and, wonderful. Yeah, and I want to thank you also, Karina, just because it's it's a great pleasure oh, yeah. for me to to meet you and to talk to you and to have this conversation with my good friend Kilo. It's just I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you it both. Thank All right. you so much. All right, folks. I guess that's going to be it. Um, so have a wonderful uh, day with yourself. You you stick around for a second, Karina. We'll say goodbye and then. Um, Anyway, yeah, we have so to tell people that now. Yeah, we'll bye. say goodbye. Yeah, yeah, everybody. Goodbye, everybody. Don't remember, guys. We say <laughs> bye, and every guest so far, except for maybe one person, has just hung up the call before we're even <laughs> done saying exactly. bye to the. To the, to the audience, and it's yeah. like, why did they abandon us? I, I like, think we're done saying goodbye to the audience now, though. So bye. we get <laughs> that way. Bye, everybody. Hey, let's take a minute.